everyone, and welcome to Connecting with Business, the Sports Professionals Edition. I'm Randy Carricker. It's great to have you with us. And it's great to welcome to our conversation today, Patrick Rich. He is the founder of the Sports Business Program at Washington University, the founder and president of Sports Impacts. He's one of the preeminent sports economists in the world. And Patrick, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks for taking some time with us. Sure, Randy. Thank you. I want to start with this, and it's a pretty broad, but I think right now a pretty salient question. How is, in this day and age of a pandemic, how is the sports economy doing? <laughs> well, it's been an unbelievably difficult year for so many different elements of the sports industry, from, from sports media, from teams that haven't been able to generate ticket sales, they haven't seen all of their, their media revenue, all of the corporate partnerships you see across the landscape, deals having to get redone, in some cases deals ended, college athletic programs cutting sports, it's really been a bloodbath. And the difficult thing, especially as we look ahead to 2021, is it's not over because we still don't know which direction this virus is going to go. And even if we're progressing in a positive way, the reality is, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, are they going to have full seasons? Are they going to have fans back? What percentage of the stadiums are going to be open? All these things are, are up in the air. And my guess is we're still going to see a lot of empty seats. We may see fewer games than normal. And if seasons get pushed back, then we run into this whole rating situation where a lot of these sports that finished at an atypical time saw ratings declines like never before. For communities at large, there are pretty tremendous uh, hazards economically to traverse when you're losing as many employees of sports teams as you're losing. Well, it's all over the map, Randy. The, the big picture with the pandemic is, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars lost in earnings by employees working at arenas, at stadiums. Because if you don't have any fans, then you don't need as many people at the ballparks, at the arenas, at the stadiums. Uh, and with respect to minor league baseball, you know, we had a team president in St. Louis recently, Kurt Hunsecker of the St. Louis Battlehawks, and he came from minor league baseball. And when you asked the question, I thought of him, because if this had happened to him while he was working in the minor leagues, maybe he doesn't have the opportunity to build up his Vita to the point where he gets a job like the Battlehawks, which unfortunate ending for the Battlehawks, but you know what? He did such a wonderful job that I think that when things come back, he's not gonna have a problem finding anything. But all of that started because he gained a great experience at the minor league uh, business of baseball level. So that coupled with how restaurants, hotels, not only in minor league sports, Randy, but youth sports. Think of all these parents that take kids uh, to select tournaments all across the country. That industry alone, the youth sports oh. travel industry, is actually generates more revenue than the NFL. $20 billion in revenue in 2019 certainly didn't reach that this year. I also want to talk about corporate partnerships, which you mentioned earlier. And last week we talked to Chad Watson from the Packers, and he was telling us about some of the creative things that even the Green Bay Packers have to do to try to maintain revenue. Do you sense that there's still an appetite on the part of corporate America to buy into sports? And I'm not talking about right now, but when hopefully we get a vaccine and we get people back, is that desire on the part of corporate America there to partner with sports? Sports are so engaging. The energy, the excitement, it captures people's attentions and hearts. And when you're trying to make connections and brands are trying to sell people, capturing them when they are at an emotional state is critical. So for those reasons, sports will all live sports will always be a great way to try to reach fans. And then again, of course, the ratings, even though they may have come down this year, they're still better than anything else out there. So, you know, the issue now is, you know, will I mean, some companies obviously during the pandemic had to back out. We saw UCLA lost Under Armour the Los Angeles Football Club, they lost Bank of California, some big deals gone by the wayside. But I, I do think that, yeah, I, I think we'll be fine, but messy right now. Patrick, before the pandemic started, as people were coming through your program, 
What part of the sports industry was the growth industry where people were getting jobs? Two, analytics and digital and social media marketing, without question. Uh, of course, we don't want to talk about analytics after the Rays and the decision to pull Snell in the sixth inning last night, but I'm not the baseball guy. I, I, I'm sure you guys probably talked about that on, uh, on your show, but um, I, I think the hard part, Randy, when, when you have analytics is we have a, a student club. That some of the kids in the student analytics club aren't even business of sports minors, but they, you know, they could be engineering, computer science kids that just love numbers and sports. And not that there aren't opportunities for kids to get on, you know, say, be the next, you know, Billy Bean or Theo Epstein. But those jobs are fewer and far between relative to other ways you can apply analytics. You can apply analytics to selling tickets, finding new customers, finding new corporate partners. So there are a lot of ways to apply business analytics that I think kids are now experiencing. And then I, I mentioned digital and social media marketing. Well, clearly that's even accelerated more during the pandemic. Uh, so that those folks in that industry will only benefit, but that's how younger people consume content, right? Mm -hmm. Is they don't watch linear TV like you and I did. They they are going on social media, Instagram and TikTok and things I probably don't even know what they are yet. Um, mm -hmm. That's how you reach these people. And so if you can show skill and, and learn from people in the industry, again, I'll I'll I'll, I'll choose another Washu alum. Her name is Steffi Blank. She works for the New York Yankees and she is their queen of digital and social media marketing. It's, you know, you really can make a career for yourself in that space. From your perspective, how valuable and how, how much of a future does the podcast have? Well, I, I'm sorry <laughs> I bring in all these names. I'm not trying to name no drop, problem. but I, I'm thinking uh, actually of a St. Louis girl. Her name is Maggie Lanter. She went to USC. She worked for Wasserman and now she's working for a startup. And guess what, Randy? It's Blue, it's, I think it's Blue Wire Podcast is the name of her company uh, that she's working with. She's in their corporate partnership division. So, I mean, their company, what they do is they help people like you and me, if we had podcasts, make those podcasts better, find partners, find sponsors, uh, help us produce the podcast so it's more polished. So that just speaks itself to, I think, how viable it is. Now, it's a crowded space. But, you know, we know that there, if you have a name and you're, you're, uh, you know, have strong content, you can kind of rise above the, uh, the rest. So yeah, I, I think it's certainly a growth area. And, and the reason that I, I bring that up, and I'm glad that you do bring up names because you have concrete examples, because what we're trying to do is help young people find their way into the industry. And I, I believe that at, at times, and certainly when I started, there weren't, there wasn't such an array of available items that you could choose from. There's, there's a, a smorgasbord of sports employment items that somebody who's looking for an entry level job can find. Even compared to when your son, and I know your son, uh, when I graduated just a few years ago and, and, you know, shoot, even now compared to them, there are many more opportunities. And I think that's the part of my job. Part of my job is spending time with the students educating them on what's out there. Here are the paths, right? I am the GPS, I'm the roadmap. It's up to you to, to go ahead and, and figure out how you go down those paths. And one of the, the great things that you do, and I want you to explain to people, is you figure out the, how much the value is of people that spend money on a particular event. And obviously that's something that's necessary. Return on investment is a huge thing. Can you explain, uh, at least from the standpoint of sports impacts, what you do with that? Well, I'll, I'll use a local example and one we've done studies at many times. Our friends at the Sports Commission do a wonderful job bringing events to St. Louis. And one of those events is the wrestling championships, the NCAA wrestling championships. So when they've hired me to, to do an economic impact study for that event, Randy, uh, I'll go down, I'll bring students from Wash U, from SLU to help me collect data. We survey people that arrive. We find out where they're from, how much money they're spending on restaurants and hotels and everything else, how long they're staying. And then we do the calculations, it usually takes a few weeks. I then have to get data from folks like the Sports Commission, from the schools themselves to just kind of verify the survey data that we received. 
and maybe capture some other numbers that I might not otherwise have. I, I don't get a chance to survey the coaches and the players to find out how much they spend on uh, restaurants, but the, the schools, in some cases, they'll provide that information and I can use that. Um, so that all goes into one big calculation to figure out how much money did this event bring into the community? And that's why, going back to one of your earlier questions, when we think about the pandemic and the events that hopefully will get replaced, but were lost last summer, gymnastics and first and second round NCAA, I mean, those were devastating to lose those because you would have filled up the Enterprise Center without question. I'm bullish on sports coming back and getting to a spot where it still makes a lot of money and people are still going to games. What's your opinion on that? I, I think that we will get there eventually, but I think that initially there is going to be some reticence because people want to make sure everything is safe. I want to believe what you believe. I just believe it's going to take, you know, it may take until 2022, 2023. We're going to need a vaccine. I, I, I do think that we'll need a vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the, the areas of the industry that have, I guess you would say, benefit from what has happened, a, a silver lining, let's say, is the touchless experience at venues. It's going to be more efficient now, more uh, stadiums and arenas. You're going to be able to use your phone to go ahead and scan your ticket, pay for concessions, uh, all these other things. That coupled with the fact that sports tech, which was already taking off, has accelerated even more. And that can be impacted at the venue where maybe you have, again, on, on an app, you can watch replays more easily, which makes the game more fun. Uh, you can play games related to the game on your app at the stadium that maybe you can't do from home. Or as we've seen people in sports media production, and we have to give the XFL a tip of the cap because they did some innovative things. We've seen some advancements there too, to make everything just a better experience. So I'm, I'm hoping, as you hope, that we'll eventually get there. There have been some silver linings along the way, but I do think 2021 is still going to be a tough year financially uh, for the industry as a whole. People can learn so much about the industry from you, whether it's college students or high school students. And I know you have a, a boot camp coming up so that kids can learn about what they're getting into in the sports industry. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I can. This will be the third iteration of the boot camp. We did it twice this summer in June and in August. And it's basically 10 hours of education, two hours with me each day, Zooming like this. I go through some PowerPoint decks. We have interaction with the students. This next camp, I believe, is November 9th through the 13th. We're meeting from 6 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. And all the information, if folks want to register, are on my website, which is patrickrish.com. And as you scroll down the homepage, you'll see information, the brochure, as well as the registration form. But we, we talk about everything, Randy. We talk about collective bargaining agreements, uh, ticket pricing, sports, the business of sports media, uh, corporate partnerships, how to brand a team or a athlete. It, 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 we're all over the map. So you get it from me. But in addition to that, you know, I bring in some of my friends from industry that sprinkle a little extra special sauce. And when they get a chance to meet these people from industry that work for, you know, teams that they follow or companies that they've heard of, I think it really, uh, you know, puts an extra jolt into the camp. And that's Patrick Rich, R-I-S-H-E dot com, correct? Correct. All right. Patrick, great information. Thanks so much for taking some time with us today. We do appreciate it. We love what you know and the fact that you shared it with us. Thanks, Randy. Talk to you soon.